Our investigations into the situation in Darfur certainly includes former President Omar al-Bashir, but also concerns other alleged perpetrators such as Mrs. Ahmed Haroun, Abdullah Banda and Abdel Rahim Mohammed Hussein, as well as Ali Mohammed Ali Abdel Rahim, also known as Ali Khushayb, who is currently in the custody of the International Criminal Court. The arrest warrants requested by my office and issued by the ICC judges against all these suspects allege numerous crimes, including notably sexual and gender-based crimes committed against a large number of Darfuri women and girls. Many have lost their relatives, children, husbands, parents, and other loved ones. Many have suffered unimaginable trauma, and many more have been living for more than a decade in IDP camps or as refugees elsewhere, struggling every day with the hope that one day they will see justice served for the ordeals they have endured. One should recall, when women are targeted and subjected to atrocity crimes, the very fabric of family and society are jeopardized. The courageous survivors and the witnesses who have shared truly harrowing stories deserve to have the possibility to share their stories in a courtroom setting too, before the judges, so that they may assist in establishing the facts. Let the evidence be weighed and for, the just, for justice to take its course. Women's voices are essential to ensure perpetrators are held to account, whether as witnesses or as victims participating in the proceedings, as we collectively work at various levels, including at the ICC, to bring, bring justice to them, and hopefully a degree of solace. This is why, when I took office as ICC prosecutor, I made sure that in investigating and prosecuting crimes against humanity and children, their safety, physical and psychological well-being, as well as dignity and privacy are ensured. To this end, my office adopted a policy on sexual and gender-based crimes, but also on crimes against and affecting children, which not only includes approaches that take into account the protection of victims, but also ensures that such crimes are systematically looked at and reflected in the charges we bring against suspects before the ICC, where the evidence supports such charges. The recent guilty verdicts by the judges of the ICC in the case against Bosco Ntaganda in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, or Dominic Ongwen of the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, are positive signals that the voices of women and children will not remain unheard, and their sufferings will not go unnoticed. Whether a daughter, a sister, or a mother whether a girl or a woman of Darfur, all deserve justice for the atrocity crimes inflicted upon them. Justice can help prevent a recurrence of what they have gone through. I strongly believe that women should hold positions of power, whether as prosecutor of the International Criminal Court or any other institution, whether big or small, local, regional, national or international, because when women lead and participate in decision-making processes, they bring a unique perspective, expertise, and experience to the table. In the field of international justice, women have a visceral insight and understanding of the adverse impact that violence has on themselves, their sisters across the world, children and societies. As a result of their experiences and their innate qualities, women leaders are uniquely placed to ensure that the thread that binds the fabric of society is tightly woven. From a more personal perspective, from a young girl, a young age as court clerk, I witnessed countless courageous women, survivors of sexual and domestic violence, relieve their ordeals through the court system. And this experience, early in my youth, triggered my drive to contribute to the advancement of the law to alleviate their suffering, to stand for what is right, and to champion the rights of the vulnerable. So indeed, as a woman and as an African, I have always been conscious of the symbolic importance of my appointment to this position, 
and I am proud of what my background has brought to my role as ICC prosecutor over the past nine years, and before that as deputy prosecutor of the ICC. And I remain profoundly committed to the work we do around the globe, bringing justice to the victims of atrocity crimes in all situations we investigate. Throughout the history of human conflict, gender-based crimes receive scant attention from investigators and prosecutors, and this was to be deplored. No mention of sexual violence was included either in the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, respecting the laws and customs of war, nor the 1945 Nuremberg Charter contained in the Agreement for the Prosecution and Punishment of major war criminals after World War II. Only since the mid-1990s, during the conflict in former Yugoslavia, has it been increasingly established through international criminal jurisprudence that sexual and gender-based crimes can be instrumentalized during conflict or in a campaign of genocide. In this context, the groundbreaking Akayesu judgment at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, or ICTR, on the 2nd of September 1998, provides the most striking example of this emerging sensitivity to gender-based violence. The judgment was the first to recognize rape as an instrument of genocide. And this also paved the way for the Rome Statute of the ICC to be the first international instrument which expressly includes various forms of sexual and gender-based crimes, including rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, and other forms of sexual violence as underlying acts of crimes against humanity as well as war crimes committed in international and non-international armed conflict. The Akayesu judgment was in no small measure made possible due to the tireless efforts of a female member of that trial chamber Judge Navi Pillay, who is a dear friend that I admire and respect, demonstrating once again how critical it is to include women in positions of authority and influence. Indeed, there are many assumptions about women that I would like to change, simply because assumptions are so often wrong. One should never make assumptions about women and one should never underestimate them. More concretely, in our line of work, female witnesses at trial are overwhelmingly more likely to be testifying as victims, particularly sexual crimes. More than half of all female witnesses in ongoing and completed trials at the ICC have provided evidence relating to sexual and gender-based crimes. A disproportionate majority of the victims of sexual crimes who have testified to date have been women. This has the potential to create or reinforce a biased narrative which portrays women only as vulnerable victims and does not represent the full experience of women in the underlying factual context of the investigations. The narrative of women as victims has to be replaced by one of survival and resilience. The time to act to change this is now. Glass ceilings, where they exist, are meant to be broken. As I often say, equality for women and women empowerment means progress for all. Until women and men can stand as full equals the world over, our work is not done. It has been just over 20 years since the adoption of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, the first in a series of UN resolutions calling for the inclusion of women's needs voices and perspectives to prevent and resolve conflict and to bring sustainable peace. Last year, we also celebrated 25 years since the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, in which the international community reaffirmed its commitment to equal rights and the inherent human dignity of women. Additionally, the theme of this year's International Women's Day is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. 
But rhetoric alone does not suffice. We all, women as well as men, need to act in our respective capacities and within our respective mandates to ensure that women and men can stand as full equals. And let us do this for the little girls who are our future, who will one day become the women everywhere, standing at the heart of our families and our communities and at the head of our institutions. I believe justice is about restoring dignity. As a witness in one of our cases once said, she said, I had lost my dignity. At that time, I was 13 years old. I was still a child. So I felt that I no longer had any dignity left. And then she added, justice must be done. The criminals have to be punished. Notwithstanding challenges, the effective investigation and prosecution of those most responsible for such heinous crimes not only contributes to ending impunity, it also challenges mindset and the culture of discrimination that allows the most serious crimes of international concern to prevail, including crimes against or affecting women. What we ultimately want to see is the non-recurrence and the prevention of these crimes. It is time to put an end to sexual violence against women and children. I believe that justice, when objectively applied and without fear or favor, can be an important tool to not only ensure accountability for the wrongs committed, but also contribute to the peaceful settlement of disputes. We must do all we can to ensure that security, stability, and the protective embrace of the law becomes a reality to be relished by all in all corners of the world. Our responsibilities remain great, but our resolve must endure. The Darfur Women's Action Group, or DWAG, has supported my office since the beginning of our investigations in Darfur. And I commend the initiatives taken by Duag under the leadership of Mrs. Nimad Ahmadi. I have known Nimad for years and I praise her relentless efforts and her determination for the women of Darfur to see those who perpetrated crimes against them brought to justice. The various activities and campaigns organized and promoted by DWAG in the margins of the ICC Assembly of States Parties and its commemoration of the International Day of Genocide every year are testimony to DWAG's commitment to the fight against impunity for international crimes. To all women of Darfur, I say this, you should not give up hope, nor doubt my determination and that of my staff to work tirelessly so that justice is delivered to the people of Darfur. As I am nearing the end of my tenure as ICC prosecutor, I want to acknowledge and express my admiration for the resilience you have shown in the face of adversity. I salute the courage many of you have shown by coming to us, to the ICC investigators, to share your testimonies over the years as we were advocating for the ICC warrants of arrest against the Darfur suspects to be implemented. We are just at the beginning of one judicial process in relation to the Darfur situation. While there is still a long way to go, I want you to remember that there is no immunity for crimes under the Rome Statute and that sooner or later, accountability will prevail. I'm also aware that despite the new chapter the people of Sudan are embarked upon, insecurity still prevails in many areas of Darfur. Women and girls are still victims of sexual violence, as I reported to the UN Security Council in December of last year. The women of Darfur, just like every woman around the world, deserve peace, security, prosperity, opportunities for a better life, and of course, justice. We remain committed to continue to play our part.